And I would just, I would echo what Mark uh, just mentioned in, in his prayer there. We, we so value those of you that serve in the, the children's ministry, both in, in Sunday school and in, in our nursery. Um, it, it's such a, I, I remember when Cheryl and I first came to know the Lord, our, 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 we had little guys and, and uh, man, it, 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 uh, it was a really a benefit to us to be able to not worry about our kids fidgeting and squirming in the service and be able to focus on the Word of God being preached. And, and so it, this is a service unto the Lord, and, and we certainly appreciate all who serve in these areas. Um, today we're uh, coming again to uh, the Word of God uh, as Martin Luther said, this is, this is the very highest form of worship right here as we come before the Word. Oh, that we don't want to take anything away from singing and giving praise to God in, in adoration in our songs. But here is where we come and we humble ourselves. And we say, Lord, I, I need wisdom from on high. I need, I need to hear the truth that I can only get from You. Speak. Lord, I come humbly, I come in, in submission to your will, your word, your wisdom. Speak to me, teach me. And through this, conform me to the image of your Son. And he certainly does this work in us. I've been thinking through the truths of Colossians 1 for these past several weeks, and the thought that's been kind of racing through my mind uh, over and over again as we come through these truths that we've looked at is, is this idea of, of standing on a, on a seashore beach. And, and, and this beach stretches on for miles and miles. And our understanding of who this God is is but a palm full of that sand. Oh, and we can add a few grains here and there, but you know, we will never exhaust the knowledge of the Lord. We will never get it all. He is so vast and so great. And so we come and we say, God, you are great. And you know, we don't even know the half of it. He is far greater than we know. And yet we thank him for the grains of sand that he does give us for the knowledge of himself that he does give. And boy, we're getting a handful here in Colossians. We study God's word and we, we pick this up uh, here in verse 24 today. Um, as we've undertaken this task of seeking to know the God of this great book, uh, the God of the Bible, the God of Colossians, uh, we've been given much to consider here. This God is the maker of all things. He is the sustainer of all things. He is the head of all things. No matter what realm we might consider, He is the preeminent one in all of it. He has perfectly revealed to us in a way that we can better understand. Now, I'm not saying we can perfectly understand. We can't completely understand. But better understand in the person of Jesus Christ, in whom full deity in bodily form dwells. He is above all things. He is before all things. He is the reconciler of all things. He it is through whom God accomplishes His eternal plan of redemption by the blood of His cross. He is the Redeemer. He is the Qualifier. He is the Citizenship Giver. He is the Rescuer, the Deliverer. He is the Forgiver of our sins. And I want to bring you back to verse 22 of our text that we looked at last week and restate a fact that is so important for us to understand because it's going to be key in our passage today as we press on in our study. Colossians 1, 21 and 22, which we looked at last week, said this, And you, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Please take note of the fact 
that the outcome of this reconciliation is not in question. There is no hint of the possibility of that outcome not being fully accomplished in Christ's death on the cross. He has, past tense, already done, reconciled you. By the way, that is a permanent deal. You will never fall into an unreconciled state. He has reconciled you. And he says, in order to present you holy. That's future. In fact, it could be better translated, reconciled in his body of flesh, in his death, so that he present you holy, blameless, above reproach. The first accomplishes the second. Even in the next statement that he makes, he says, if you continue in the faith, that is not a statement of doubt, but rather a safe assumption on the part of Paul that all who are reconciled, all who are in Christ, all for whom Christ died, all who have been redeemed by the blood of his cross will be presented holy and blameless. It's a guarantee as their continuing is not in the least dependent on them. It is Christ who holds them fast. There will never be a day when anything beyond the finished work of Christ on the cross will ever be evaluated to determine your salvation. Ever. Not your failures. Not your sins. Not your good works. Not the lack of good works. There will never be a day. Yes, as believers, our works will be evaluated by Christ. We will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10 makes this abundantly clear. We also see this in passages like 1 Corinthians 3, like 1 Corinthians 4, verse 5. Let me read that for you. It says this, Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his, not condemnation, but commendation from God. Believers will never be condemned. They will only be commended. None condemned. Exactly what we see in the testing of chapter 3 in 1 Corinthians of each man's work. Those works, they may be burnt up, but the man will be saved. The man will never be lost. This, the accounting of believers before the Lord Jesus Christ. For the believer, our works will be evaluated for reward, but never for condemnation. You see, Jesus Christ is no half-savior. He he does not initially save and then leave us to our own work to ensure that we maintain that standing before him. There is no such thing as initial justification. The only justification the Bible knows of is a full, final, finished, forever justification which ensures solely based on the finished work of Christ that the justified will never ever stand for one moment in any other state but blameless before God, completely right with Him. He always glorifies those He justifies. Always. That is, in fact, a promise of God. Your works do not in the least come into play because His works have already accomplished everything you need to be fully and finally saved. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. 
to declare that our works will ever come into play in the salvation equation in any fashion whatsoever is to declare that the works of Christ are somehow deficient to fully save. Brothers and sisters, that is not at all what the Bible says. That is not Christian thinking, actually. And it has been repeatedly condemned in the history of the church. In fact, this was one of the principal articles of the Protestant Reformation. How is a man justified? What does the word justified even mean? And if we truly understand that word, it leaves no room of any sort for future judgment because to be justified is to already have been judged and declared by that judge right with his justice. Eternally right with his justice. Romans 8 verse 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation, none whatsoever. No condemnation for those who are in Christ. In fact, that's part of Paul's reasoning for writing this very letter that we're studying. And like the book of Galatians, which we finished studying a few months back, Colossians is a polemic letter. It is a letter strongly written to correct false teaching. And this is, in fact, one of the false teachings that was pressing on the believers in Colossae. For us to hold any other view would be for us to to stand in the very place of the false teachers that Paul is writing to warn about in this letter to the Colossians. So let's read our text for today, this passage, as we press on in our study, beginning at verse 24, and let's ask the Lord to bless us in our study. Verse 24 says, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for how your word lays it straight. Uh, For how you speak to us plainly and reveal to us your truth. Father, we pray that as we study this morning, you would be pleased to give us understanding uh, not just in our minds, Father, but in in our very core of our being, Father, our desire, like we said, is to submit to your word, to to receive the truth, to understand it, and that it would actually change our lives, that that it would mold us, conform us, shape us into the image of your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray this, that you would be honored in us and through us. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So we have a ton in this passage that we can work through together. Paul begins with the words, now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. And so we need to understand a little bit of the sufferings that Paul is alluding to here. It's more than just his current situation. It includes that, certainly. But it includes all of his suffering since he met Christ on the road to Damascus. Listen to Paul's own words about his sufferings in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning at verse 23. We read this. With far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings and often near death, five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. 
A night and a day I was adrift at sea, on frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship, uh, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure, And apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. This guy suffered. His life was marked with suffering. Again, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, we read this in verse 3. We put no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way by great endurance in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love by truthful speech and the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness for our right hand and for our left, through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise, we are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as punished and yet we are killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing yet possessing everything. What a life. This man knew what it was to suffer. And yet we also take in account the current situation as Paul is writing this letter. He is writing this letter in a condition of imprisonment in Rome as he awaits his case to be heard by the emperor, by Caesar himself, which could well result in his death. And yet look what it says here. I rejoice in my sufferings. I rejoice In verse 23, Paul told us that this gospel proclaimed throughout the earth, he has become a minister of it. And and that's not something that Paul chose. This wasn't a life decision placed before him. Huh, what do I want? Do I want to be a carpenter? Do I want to be a... You know what, I'm going to go into the ministry. No, this, this wasn't Paul's choice at all. It was, in fact, something that was chosen for him by the Lord Jesus Himself, who came to him that day on the road to Damascus. The Lord that day came to Paul. He revealed Himself to the man and and left him blind in his sight. God instructed another man in the city to go out and to meet him, to pray over him that he would receive his sight. And listen to the Lord's words to that man regarding the newly saved Paul. In Acts chapter 9, verse 15, the Lord said to to this man, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. Paul is, of course, not the only one who suffered for the name of Christ, and nor is he the only one who rejoiced in his sufferings for the name of Christ. In Acts chapter 5, some of the apostles were arrested for preaching the gospel. They were beaten and they were commanded to preach in Jesus' name no more. And yet, when they were released, we read this in Acts 5 verse 41. They, then they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name What we can see here from these passages is that the joy of the Christian life is not something that's based on our circumstances. A joyless Christian, regardless of circumstances, is one who has lost focus on who they are. John MacArthur says it this way, a joy is generated by humility. People lose their joy when they become self-centered, thinking they deserve better circumstances or treatment than they are getting. 
You see, the truth to be told is what I deserve and what you deserve, we deserve to go to hell. And anything north of that is grace. Anything north of that is blessing. Lack of joy is equal to declaring to God that we deserve better than He has given us. Oh, brothers and sisters, anything north of hell is worthy of our praising God and rejoicing. Aristides, a second century non-Christian theologian, wrote to the Roman emperor about early Christians and stated that If there were any among them who died, they would give thanks to God and rejoice. When a child was born to Christian parents, they would give thanks to God and rejoice. And if that child were to die in infancy, they would give thanks to God and rejoice because they knew that that child would pass through this world without encountering sin and would be embraced by the Lord. What a ministry. What a testimony to the world around them that no matter their circumstances, they gave thanks to God and rejoiced even in difficult times, even in suffering. You see, humility guards our joy. Understanding what we really deserve guards our joy. Trusting in the Lord no matter what our circumstances protects the joy that is ours in Christ. The question for us to consider is why rejoice? Why did Paul rejoice? And why should we rejoice? Verse 24 says this, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of His body, that is, the church. The Colossian heresy which Paul counters in this letter taught, among other things, that the Christian life must include human works which are necessary for salvation. Is Paul somehow agreeing with this here? Well, some would actually interpret it this way. The words used here, filling up what is lacking, is a word that we need to understand. The New American Commentary says this, Paul used an unusual term for fill up, occurring only here in all of Scripture. The basic root means to fill, as to fill in substance or content. The preposition again is a prefix to the root, and another Greek preposition, in the place of, anti, is added to it. Together, the word literally conveys the idea of completing in the place of, or completing for someone else. The word seems to demand the idea of exchange and vicariousness and repetition. Some would say, you see, you see what Paul says here. Christ's afflictions, as important as they are, they're not quite enough. Something remains that needs to be filled up by us. And so our suffering, just like Jesus suffered, is helping to bring it across the finish line. Jesus' work was absolutely essential, yes, But, there's a little bit more to do. And this is one of the ways that people can interpret this verse. That our sufferings and our works somehow add to Christ's atonement. It doesn't deny Christ's atonement. But it renders that atonement insufficient to fully save and requires believers to contribute to their own salvation. I want to tell you that if in any way we have works that are going to be evaluated and judging for the outcome of our salvation, we are doing exactly the same thing. No matter how we might spin it, 
what we're doing is declaring that Christ's finished work is not enough. Jesus' declaration on the cross speaks counter to that. What did he say? It is finished. It is completely complete. It is finished does not only apply to our justification, it applies to, it applies to the whole of our salvation. His work on the cross has accomplished it all, and it secures it eternally for every single one for whom he died. Listen to Romans 5, verses 8 through 11. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since, therefore, we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more, now having been reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that. We also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Our justification came by his death and resurrection, but much more, we are saved now eternally by his life. There is no more work to be evaluated for our salvation because it has been fully accomplished. When we speak of have been saved, are being saved, will be saved. It is not as if we're suggesting that there's more to do which needs to be added before we are finally saved. We have been saved, not just justified, saved. Right? Ephesians 2, by grace you have been saved. In Christ, he has secured it. And in that salvation, we are secure. We are presently walking as saved men and women, and certainly God is continuing a work in us. Absolutely. But that continued work is not in the least adding to our salvation. We will one day be saved. And this is not something that is up in the air. It is a promise kept by a faithful God. It is already ours. It's already ours. Yet one day we will fully possess it in Christ. Just because the promise has not been fully carried out, just because it's not all in our hand right now, does not in any way suggest that there's anything lacking for which we must perform. Let me ask you this. If there were more works for you to accomplish in order to secure your salvation, how well would you have to perform in order to meet the standard? In order to be saved, the only standard my God knows of is perfection. Anything short of perfection, and you're out. And so, if there's any work for us to do, my question would be how are you doing at that? This is an issue that often plagues many young believers in the faith. My son Joshua, having recently come to know Christ in his life, has had a degree of struggle in this area. He, he spoke of that when he gave his testimony just before Christmas. Christ has saved me. I have believed. He has justified me. But I wonder if I'm living well enough. I wonder if I'm, if I'm performing well enough. Now that I've been saved, in order to remain saved, Which leads to the question, did Christ really save? He, he shared his testimony and, and, and he spoke of these things. And you know what? The, the truth is, this is not unusual. 
for young believers. And you know what the result is? It's a lack of assurance. In fact, if your works come into play, I guarantee you, you do not have assurance. Because every time you sin, I, I, must, I must not really be saved. Every time. Every time you don't accomplish quite as well as you could have. I, I, I fell short. I didn't quite meet the standard. And a lack of assurance results. A lack of hope follows. And, and, and I'm not talking about I, I hope so, but I'm talking about bib- biblical hope. The certainty of things to come which have been promised by our Father. If your works are in play in salvation, you too will never find peace to live in that kind of hope. You'll be like a small boat in the midst of a hurricane, tossed to and fro, trying to bear the weight of your own salvation. If there's anything in it of you, you're done. Uh, J. Gresham Machen wrote this. Condemnation comes by merit. Salvation comes only by grace. Condemnation is earned by men. Salvation is given by God. Oh, amen. Praise God that that's true. Because if that's not true, we're in trouble. We can and we should live a life characterized by thanksgiving for what we do have. Eternal salvation as a gift wholly given by God. A complete and fully accomplished salvation, even though not all of what salvation entails has been fully realized by us. One day it will be. Anything less will kill the possibility of joy. And Paul is going on to show us where our hope is to be placed later in this passage. A hope that is certain. A hope that, that, that will move us to a life that is pleasing to the Lord. You see, one comes as a result of the other. Never the other way around. We can never get these two things confused. Our hope leads to a life motivated to please the Lord. There are two other ways that we could view this passage. Not everybody obviously views this passage as our needing to add to the work of Christ. Obviously, the Christian, true Christianity does not hold to that. There are two other ways that we could interpret this passage. Um, One, a way that is somewhat mystical, um, similar maybe, Uh, it's... If we recall Paul's conversion, for example, Paul was a persecutor of Christians. Christ came to him on the road to Damascus, and he introduced himself to Paul with these words. Acts chapter 9, verse 4. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. And so Paul, as he was persecuting Christians, was called out by the Lord for persecuting Christ. And so, as the church suffers, we fill up what is lacking in Christ's suffering because it is Christ Himself who suffers when we are persecuted. Here, at least, we're not really uh, having the issue of, of... with, with paying a portion of the price in atonement, but we do have the same problem that Christ's payment, though Christ Himself is still paying it, His payment of the cross in this interpretation is still deficient. It's still not able to fully save. There's more that needs to be done. And again, we can see that problem here. A far better way to interpret this uh, is is simply that Paul says, 
in my flesh I am suffering, uh, in, in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church. In my pain, in my suffering, I am able to benefit the entirety of the body, the church. Paul wasn't suffering because of his heritage. He wasn't suffering because how he looked. He wasn't suffering because he had some accent that set him apart or anything like that. He suffered simply because he preached the cross. He preached the gospel. He was working for the benefit of the spread of the gospel, which brought him suffering, which increased the spread of the gospel. And people saw Paul's willingness to suffer for Christ and, and, and saw that Paul really did believe what he preached, which encouraged the church, which convicted sinners. And the Lord used this to build and grow His church. When Jesus walked this earth in human flesh, the world pe- persecuted Him. But now, Jesus is no longer in this world. The world can no longer get their hands on Him Oh, but they can get their hands on those who preach His message. They can harm His ministers of the Gospel. In Galatians 6, verse 17, Paul said, I bear on my body the marks of Christ. He's not in any way claiming himself to be Christ. He's not in any way claiming that somehow those marks are adding to Christ's finished work on the cross. His life lived for Christ is what brought the trials that he endured. He suffered because he belonged to Christ. And yet he suffered for the sake of the church. You know, here's the thing. Did Paul have to preach the gospel in order to be saved? No. His salvation was based on Christ's death on the cross. Paul, like us, he, he, he could have walked away and, and, and reduced the suffering in his own life. But for the sake of the church, out of love for the Father of the church, Paul suffered. He suffered for us. It's because of his suffering that we're reading his words today. He suffered for the sake of the church. Let me read this amazing passage to you from 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3-7. through 7. Paul wrote, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our afflictions. I wonder how Paul would have known that. Well, he lived a life of afflictions. He who comforts us in all our afflictions so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are uh, comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comforts. Our sufferings in this life the Lord Jesus uses to encourage others, to comfort others. He uses our our sufferings to spread the message of Christ. Look at the very next statement that Paul makes here in verse 25 in Colossians 1. Of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. He suffers for the sake of the church. He has been appointed as a minister of the gospel for the sake of the church. He has been given this stewardship from God for the sake of the church 
to make the word of God fully known. He had been given a ministry to fulfill, and he gave himself to that ministry. Acts chapter 20, Paul called the elders from Ephesus to himself, and he told them in Acts 20 verse 18, he said this, You yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and trials, that happened to me through the plots of the Jews, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I am going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not count my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I received from the Lord to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Do you see how Paul gave himself to this ministry? the ministry of proclaiming the whole counsel of God, and it cost him everything. And we may be inclined to think that that this guy really earned something. And certainly we know there are rewards. Paul spoke much of those rewards. But but look at Paul's words here in, in Colossians 1. Let me skip down to verse 29, if, if you'll allow me to jump ahead and, and deal with this verse together here with Paul's ministry. Verse 29 says, For this I toil, struggling with all his energy, that he powerfully works within me. Paul says, I toil, I struggle with His strength, with His energy, with Him moving me along. Paul is not in the least claiming that unless he gives himself to the working of the Spirit within him, that he is, might somehow not be finally saved. That doesn't in the least appear in this text. Rather, because the Spirit is in Paul, Because the Spirit is at work in Paul's life, he is toiling and struggling and giving himself to the ministry. Again, we got to be really careful that we're not confusing these things. One is the result of the other. Yes, we have work to do. We have been saved. Past tense, Ephesians 2 tells us, fully saved in every way, and this not of ourselves, It is the gift of God. It is salvation by grace through faith. Uh, let Let me make sure that we get that right. We are not saved by faith. We are not saved by faith. We are saved by Jesus Christ through faith. Let's not confuse those. We are saved by Christ through faith. And like I mentioned last week, he is both the object of and the originating cause of that faith. We have no grounds for boasting, not even in the faith that we possess, because we didn't do any of it. It's all of him. We have been made alive Ephesians 2 verse 4 says, We have been recreated by Him. And as Ephesians 2.10 tells us, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Our works arise from our salvation, never the other way around. Paul knew there was work to do. He gave himself to that work, yes. But there was no thought of his achieving any part of his salvation. He was simply walking in the works which he had been saved 
to walk in. Because his salvation resulted in such thanksgiving and such trust of the Lord. Preaching the gospel was this work for Paul. And he walked in that work as the Spirit moved him along. He says to make the Word of God fully known. Paul gives us clarity on this in verse 26. He says, The mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints, to them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery. Mystery. It's a word that Paul uses to speak of something hidden but now revealed. A word he always uses to speak in reference to a portion of the gospel. The Bible is not God's revealing to us of all things. He has revealed to us what we need to know. And we believe that God has progressively revealed this knowledge to us. What we have in the New Testament is new revelation, which adds to the revelation we previously had. The Old Testament tells us much. It tells us much of sin. It tells us much of of God's righteous character. It tells us that God is a judge. It tells us of the promise of God to save His people. In fact, the Old Testament tells us in pretty clear terms of God's provision of a Savior who would come and bear the iniquities of His people as a substitute. None of that is new in the New Testament. The Old Testament tells us how God would save not only Jews but also Gentiles. None of that is the mystery which Paul references here. Paul refers to many things as mystery now revealed. How this Savior would come. His incarnation. That is new in the New Testament. That's new revelation. How would anyone anyone ever be able to bear the iniquities of God's people and pay the price to satisfy God's justice? How would that happen? What would that look like? That's new. This mystery includes how God would harden the hearts of Israel in order to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. That's new. The mystery of Jews and Gentiles united in the church. That's new revelation. The mystery of the ends to which we are look forward when Christ comes to take His people into His kingdom through the resurrection of the just to life and the wicked to judgment. That's new revelation. This mystery has now been made known to God's people in the church age through Paul and the other New Testament writers. Revelation, making the Word of God fully known. And I want you to see in this text that Paul makes it clear that these mysteries are not something we have to figure out. There, there's so many people who, who claim that there's this secret knowledge, you know, Bible codes and things like that, right? Well, listen, if your understanding of this book does not come from a straightforward, plain reading of the text, if you have to be taught your understanding, it's probably not coming from this book. God has not laid a riddle out for us to figure out. God calls us sheep. There are implications to that. God knows how smart we are. Or maybe if we could flip that over, God knows our lack of intelligence. God does not set a puzzle before us and say, here you go, see if you can get it. God speaks to us plainly in His Word. He says, to them God chose to make known. 
God is making it clear. God knows that if we are ever going to get his truth, he has to speak it to us plainly. And now, Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles as God sent him to preach the gospel to make Christ known to these. He says this mystery, hidden, but now revealed to the saints. God has chosen to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery. The saints, both Jews and Gentiles, have been made to know that God's salvation is not limited to the Jews. The riches of the glory of this mystery. What are these riches? Well, he says, to them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you. The hope of glory. Oh, now that's new. That's new revelation. That's a mystery now revealed. Christ in you. No one reading the Old Testament saw that coming. Sure, God would come and He would be with His people, but this has now been revealed that Christ now comes to indwell His people. John chapter 14, Jesus tells His disciples about His coming departure. And He says, it's for your good that I go away. Because if I go, I can send the Helper, the Spirit of Truth. He will come, He will be with you, and He will be in you. Hard to believe. I mean, put yourself in the disciples' shoes there. They've been walking three years with Jesus. They've seen the amazing things the Lord Jesus has done. They've heard the amazing teaching that He's given. And He says, listen, it's for your good that I go away. Can you imagine how hard that would have been to accept? And He says, it's going to be good for you because one even, even better for you is coming. And He's going to dwell in you. They, they said, they, they had the idea, well, what could be better than having Jesus walk beside us? Well, what could be better than, than having Jesus with us, telling us what we should and shouldn't do, how we should and shouldn't live, and all of this, what we should and shouldn't believe? And he says, it's better for you because this one, this spirit, he's going to come and he's going to live in you. He's going to indwell you. And MacArthur writes this, when Christ comes to live in a believer, His presence is the anchor of the promise of heaven, the guarantee of future bliss eternally, in the reality that Christ is living in the Christian life, uh, in the Christian is the experience of new life and hope of eternal glory. Again, earlier in the text, we spoke of regeneration of the Christian, being made new, being given a a, a new heart, a, a new spirit being put in us. A spirit that longs for God, that hungers for God. Well, that spirit is none other than the spirit of Christ Himself. He he comes and He takes up residence in us. And His coming, Ephesians tells us, is a deposit guaranteeing final salvation as we enter glory. Verse 28, Paul says, Him, Christ, This Christ that that is in us, Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. And so Paul's ministry, uh, really the ministry of the entire church is to proclaim Him. To speak these mysteries now revealed to the world around us. Him we proclaim. Him we publicly declare. And notice it is both in the positive and in the negative. Warning everyone. Admonishing. A strong, stern the voice of correction regarding sin and, and coming judgment. Later in, in Colossians, we see Paul instructs the, the church uh, to, to also pick up on this responsibility. Colossians 3, verse 16, he says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. You see, we have a part to play in this 
admonishing, this proclaiming Him through corrective warnings. We, we can't proclaim Christ without also warning of judgment and consequence of sin. But also, this proclamation includes a positive charge to teach, to, to impart spiritual truth. We all have this responsibility as well. You see, the Great Commission is not something that was given only to the leadership of the church to undertake. It's something that was given to all Christians. We all have a responsibility to proclaim Him in teaching. The purpose of our proclamation of Christ, who indwells His people, is not simply to make converts. Yes, we want to see people make decisions for Christ, of course. But the Great Commission is not to make converts. It is to make disciples, which is exactly what Paul is getting at here. He's not in any way saying, listen, you know what we need to do? Uh, we, we need to proclaim Him. We need to warn everyone. We need to teach everyone in all wisdom so that we might make sure that they're really saved. That's not what he says. He says that we may present everyone mature in Christ. Uh, do you know that there are immature believers and they're going to be in glory with us? All who are believers are going to be in glory with us. But our purpose is both that people would come to know Christ and as they come to know Christ, that we disciple them, that we, that we build them up, that we teach them the truths of God's Word, that they mature in that faith and live more and more for Christ in that faith. Not so that they can somehow earn standing, but so they can simply glorify Jesus Christ in this world. We want to bring them up in the faith. We want, in light of that faith, as they're built up in that faith, to see them walk in that faith in their daily life. That as they come to know Christ and He is at work within them by means of, of giving further depths of knowledge of His will, that we would come to look more and more and more and more like Christ every day. Go back to verse 9 here in the opening chapter of Colossians. What was Paul's prayer there? His prayer was that God would fill these believers with the knowledge of His will and all spiritual understanding and wisdom. How, how does that happen? Well, it, it's by proclaiming Him. And so Paul prays it, and now he's doing it. He prays they would be filled with spiritual wisdom and understanding that God's will would be revealed and now he's revealing God's will to them. He's following through on his own prayer. He's proclaiming Jesus to them, laying out this knowledge for them and to what end? Well, let's read his prayer again in Colossians 1.9. And so from the day that we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. We want you to have more and more revelation from God, more understanding of this mystery that's been made known. Not so that you would be Christians. They're already Christians. But, but so that as you live every day of your life, you would grow to look more like Christ. You would walk fully pleasing to Him. Paul prayed it. And Paul is living in response to that prayer in our passage here as we see his instruction. He's trusting God in the very thing that he prayed. He was praying in the will of God. Now he's walking in that will. That God would use Paul. Do you see what he's doing? God, fill them with the knowledge of your will. And I give myself to you that you use me to fill them with the knowledge of your will. Isn't that beautiful? Do we pray like that? Do we give ourselves to God 
as we understand that we're praying in the will of God, do we give ourselves to the will of God like that? God has made us for good works. And by feeding on the word of God, we believers are strengthened, we are edified, we are prepared, we are fit, fitted by the word of God, by the ministry of the spirit of God, to walk in those works. Those works don't save us. Those works are the result of our salvation. They are the results of God's continued work of grace in us and they testify, yes, they testify to the fact that we are God's people. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the clarity of your word. I thank you for teaching us as we study. I thank you for the ministry of the Apostle Paul. I thank you for his sufferings, which he endured for us. Oh, he he didn't atone for our sins like your son did. Oh, and we thank you in a very special way for your son. He's the only one that completed the works required for our salvation. But we thank you for the sufferings of the Apostle Paul because he suffered for us. He suffered for our sake. He suffered that we might have this revelation of God, the Word of God made fully known to us. What a glorious thing this is that we stand here today and we read the words of the Apostle Paul, which are ultimately the words of Christ revealed to us through Paul. Thank you for them. God, thank you for uh, teaching us this morning by means of your spirit. We, We pray that you would continue to do your work in us. Father, we desire to walk in good works. We love you. Our longing is to honor you in our lives. We fall miserably short of 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 perfection in this area but our desire is to honor you our desire is to live for you our desire is to make you known both in our words and in our deeds thank you for grace god thank you for grace we give you such praise father And we pray all of these things in the name of your Son, our Savior.